My mic doesn't come to the end. Doesn't come to the end. Yeah, I used to do a class where the director of the class wanted us to film the students when they're doing their presentations and then it wasn't to watch it. And I felt so bad for these students because everybody was terrified all the time. You're supposed to be like, this is good for you. Is it really? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think it's third school to push back from the person who's watching one. Then you don't, I don't know how well you watch yourself. Yeah, like it's like recoiling. Yeah. So there is a. That's what we're doing for a lot of questions for people. No, not a lot No, it's questions. not a lot of questions. If you can do it from your phone, uh, perfect. Otherwise, I will. Uh, that was fire. One that is uh, question. Yeah, I don't know. But I don't know. But I don't know. But I don't know. For people to like, uh, yeah, you will, you should see the question. People can ask questions, can vote on them. I should see here. Yeah, like for example, uh, if I was were to ask a question, like. Uh, oh, okay. Okay, and uh, and then once it's on, uh, once it's answered, I will like uh, make it. Uh, I will remove it once it has been uh, answered. Yeah, okay, I will do it. I will take care of it. So yeah, otherwise I think uh, we're good. Can uh, can everyone hear us on Zoom? Yes. Okay. Yeah, they can hear us. They didn't start for. It was like the um, the pieces. Can see the sound. Yeah, it doesn't look different. Yeah, it's like I haven't been sure. What do we see? If yeah. they can hear the sounds. Um, I think you have to share screen first. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure you share the oh. screen. Do you? No, no, yet. All right, so I'm gonna start sharing. No, it doesn't let me. Is that supposed to disable? Okay, now, now you should be able to share the screen. Okay. Um, I'm going to share sounds and let's we'll see if that works. So, um, let's see if we go to the other question is going to hear this. Yep. Did they hear that? Did uh, everyone hear the yes? The, 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 everything. I think, uh, I think we are good to go, Alex. Okay. If you yeah, sure. Yeah, you can. It's my pleasure to welcome uh, Monty Scavi to NYU. I just said welcome back because yeah. he was uh, scheduled to do a sabbatical last year with Dan Saints, and unfortunately a pandemic hit, and we had to go back. Hopefully, he'll come back to NYU. Uh, Monty is a um, uh, is trained as an electrical engineer, and um, he got a master's here at Columbia. Then he went to UC Berkeley and UCSF. Um, he got his PhD with Christoph Schreiner, and they did some really nice stuff on telemetry processing. Um, after his PhD, 
I'm like, I'm like us normal schmucks. He went straight for position at <laughs> University of Connecticut, uh, where he's been since uh, in, the, in the School of Engineering, right? Yes. And uh, Monty is a rare individual who um, makes computer models based on the data that he collected himself. And um, lately, he's been process, he's been um, examining how neural networks are uh, represent complex sound features. So. Yeah, you are to add your, your, your notes. You are not in presentation mode. Um, Everyone is saying that they are seeing. Oh, but you shut this screen. I think you have to shut the, the other screen. Over here, we're seeing yeah. it. All right, so I'm going to have to do it in regular mode. Yeah. All right. Because everyone me... could see all of your notes. And... Okay. All right. <laughs> let's, let's try it this way. All right. Thanks so much, Alex. Um, and thanks, everybody in NYU for um, inviting me here. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, like Alex said, I was doing sabbatical here with Dan. Um, and the unfortunate circumstances of the pandemic hit. Uh, I'll be glad to say that I applied for sabbatical. It's made it probably two thirds of the way up. So I may be coming back. So we'll see if that does or it does not work out. Um, they might be allowing me to do it, despite the fact that there's a six way, six year time limit between sabbaticals technically. So, um, so that this um, this image here is sort of appropriate to describing the task at hand. Um, uh, obviously, you can look at that image, and I think it's very evident that that is um, right here in the city in Times Square. Um, and um, I, I think there's a variety of different information that can be gained for that from that image. On the one hand, if I look at it um, visually, um, and I just glance at it, I could see right away that that's a busy city street. There's people in the image that everybody's moving around. There's a lot of action. Um, I could look at it in more detail, and then I could actually recognize. I could actually tell if I look at it in more detail um, and fixate more on individual objects. I can actually tell that that's actually Times Square, right in the heart of New York City. Um, on the other hand, I could actually try to think of this image in terms, in terms of the acoustic um, scenery that it might evoke overall. And you can imagine it's going to be a very busy street with a lot of street noise. Um, you might hear cars whizzing by, so on and so on. So all those nuances of the sounds of the city, um, you would be able to capture those. And hopefully, you would be able to identify those as a busy street as a whole. And we can actually think about the, the processes that might be involved um, um, in doing this. And somehow my keyboard is not working. So we could think about um, how this image might be processed in the visual world, where we can think about early low levels of processing, where we might be doing some feature extraction. Um, you can think about what you know the retina might be doing in terms of pulling out individual spots of light. Um, then subsequently go into let's say visual cortex where we have things like edge sensitivity and directional sensitivity. Um, and we could then think about what may happen next. Um, you can think about mid-level integration, higher level processing that may go on where you start looking at interdependencies between different visual aspects, visual patches in the images. And then ultimately, at some point where you get to very high level cortices, that information is going to be pulled and you're going to be able to come up with perceptual decisions um, and behavioral decisions overall. And on the one hand, you can think about this for, for the image um, representation and how that image is perceived. But I think the same could be said about auditory in many realms. So I think very clearly from that short snippet, you could actually hear sort of whizzing cars by, you could hear a siren. It gives you that illusion that there's sort of a, you know, you're in a busy city street, um, you know, and, and, and it sort of gives you at least some way to conceptualize um, what is going on in the surrounding environment. Now, the, the work that I'll be presenting today is partly um, um, motivated by some early visual work that was done right here at NYU by Portia and Simoncelli. Um, where they actually came up with a model um, for texture synthesis. And the, the, the generic idea behind this is that you have a model that models sequential stages of visual processing. So you have a model that sort of basically does um, feature extraction or filtering analogous to what the retina might do, where it pulls out visual patches. You have some oriented, orientation selective layers, which are more analogous to, let's say, what um, visual cortex might be doing. Um, and then you have some subsequent pooling 
And within each of those layers, what you could actually do is measure different statistics of the individual images that you're trying to represent. So for example, at the low levels, you could compute some basic statistics like these marginal statistics, the mean and the variance of the image. Um, you can look at the subsequent letter, uh, subsequent layers, more intricate relationships like correlated activity between different image points um, across different scales um, uh, uh, and different orientations, let's say. And then even at higher levels, you can even look at more abstract dependencies that you may see in the subsequent secondary layers. And it turns out when you actually do this, um, you can actually synthesize very realistic visual images um, um, that were you know, derived. And again, you're using only statistical structure to derive these. But nonetheless, these images do look quite realistic. They do look quite a bit like the original images. So this model was actually extended in 2010, I believe, um, by um, Josh McDermott working alongside Aerosim and Shelley. And what they did is they actually extended the model to the auditory world. Um, basically, they, they took a model that's nearly identical with the key difference that auditory information is largely processed over time. And so they would take a model that would mimic different stages of processing in the auditory system. Processing is being done over time. And the idea is that you could actually measure statistical structure from those sounds in the auditory representation. And then the question is whether you could actually generate or synthesize um, viable auditory textures. And just, just as a note, auditory textures, um, these are just gener generic sounds that are, um, for the most part, stationary. Um, you could think of images like running or sounds like running water. You could think of sounds like the the noise in that crowd or maybe even in the street noise. Um, these are the sounds that would be representative or described, ap aptly described as a texture. And uh, McDermott and Simon Shelley basically postulated and they showed quite nicely in this um, paper that these summary statistics appear to be really important for being able to perceive realistically these sounds and also for being able to identify these particular sounds and so this instantly brings up a couple of questions. First um, and foremost, where is this happening? Um, what, you know, is, is, are these statistics somehow being represented in the brain? And I won't necessarily answer that question fully in the talk, that percent, but I'll provide evidence that some of these statistics may be able to, we may be able to capture them directly from brain activity. So we're going to be trying to read these statistics. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to sort of conceptualize the notion that you could think about a model and think about statistics of the model, but we could do the same thing with brain activity. And we could actually look at the brain activity and measure statistics from the neural activity in a very much analogous fashion as what they did with the model. We're going to be doing the same thing, but with real brain data in this case. And then if we are able to do this, then this brings up a whole host of other questions of how these statistics may actually contribute to a variety of auditory tasks. So you can think about recognition of sounds, categorization of sounds where you have broader categories of sounds and maybe even difficulties when you're talking about listening in the presence of background noise, whether these different types of statistics may ultimately contribute to these different types of phenomena. Now, I think the, the idea that statistics are important on the audition is not necessarily new. I think what, what Josh McDermott and Simon Shelley basically showed that that's very um, sort of motivating in this case is the idea that these statistics are actually really critical for recognition, not necessarily just simply for coding. They actually, if you take these statistics out and don't use statistics or incorporate the right statistics, you could actually very abruptly affect the recognition um, of particular sounds. But, but the idea that the brain is encoding some of these statistics is not new. I mean, we, we had done a fair amount of work looking at how different statistics of the sound affect neural representation, along with a whole host of other folks who've looked at the same type of questions. And indeed, what you find is that auditory um, neurons at different levels of the auditory system are very um, strongly affected by different types of statistics and sounds. So there's sort of at least potential that these statistics may be useful and they may be actually encoded directly within the brain activity. So how does it do, do, do this? Um, how does the brain encode this information um, and potentially? And then not only that, could the information that is being represented in the neural activity um, ultimately be used for the purpose of texture recognition um, in this particular case? 
So um, my postdoc, um, Xu Sai, sort of uh, attempted to answer the, some of these questions and provide an initial look at how the brain may be encoding some of these relevant statistics that we're mentioning here. Um, so the way she approaches, she's going to be reporting in an animal model. Um, she's going to be looking at um, data from the auditory midbrain, and we're going to be delivering natural texture sound and a variety of synthetic variants where we can sort of manipulate the specifics of the statistics that are included in these sounds. So let me let me just show you real quickly what this model looks like. And again, this is not our model, but it's really the model of McDermott and Simon Shelley. So the generic idea is that we have sound waveform. It comes in and it goes and it gets represented as this cochlear spectrogram. Basically, it's going through a cochlear filter bank that extracts the envelopes for each of the frequency channels. And from that, we could actually compute a variety of statistics. So you can start out with some relatively simple statistics, what we call M1, um, the mean, variance, and the skewness. Those are giving us relatively simple statistics that on the one end, we could partly relate to the power spectrum, but also to other aspects of the temporal waveforms on each channel. But more intricately, we could actually consider second order relationships. Like we could look at the correlations that exist between different frequency channels. And it turns out those are actually perceptually in audition, they're really important, um, often described as co-modulation. The idea that you may have channels that are being co-modulated turned on and off concurrently over time. All right, so not only do, can we do this at the first level of processing, we could then go to another secondary level, a mid-level, which is much more analogous to the structure that we're gonna be reporting from the inferred colliculus. And in this level, what we're going to do is we're actually going to further decompose these cochleograms by a set of modulation filters. Um, basically, the, the, the sound is now being broken up into different temporal resolutions from very coarse temporal features to successively finer and more detailed temporal features. And what we could then do is we could do the same thing. So what Josh McDermott and Simicelli basically apply the same approach to the secondary level. You can compute simple statistics, the M2, um, which are the marginal statistics at the secondary level, the mean, the variance, and the skewness. Um, but then in addition to that, we can look at the interdependencies that exist across different modulation channels. Again, sort of following the same, same approach. So these are now the second order correlations that exist at the modulation stage. So here's some examples of um, some of the sounds that we're using. Um, these are actually the sounds that we're going to be using experimentally for some of the animal work, as well as some of the human experiments that we did. Um, so we start out, you know, we have fire, the birds, the crowd, the water, and a snake sound. If you look at the, cochle the, the cochleogram, the spectral um, models, um, you can see that they're actually quite different. The snake sound, for instance, has more power at the high frequencies, whereas if we were to take, for example, the crowd sound, it's more tailored towards the lower frequencies overall. Not only do you know that the spectrum appear to be different, but sort of the temporal signature, how the sound is fluctuating over time, um, they look quite distinct. In this case, it looks pretty random for the crowd, but you can see the bird where things are fluctuating on and off as a function of time very distinctly. And some of these features are effectively being captured by different levels of these statistics. So for instance, um, the power spectrum, um, I don't recall which one it is, I believe it's the red one, is sort of captured directly in these curves right here. And you can see, for instance, you know, for, for the power spectrum of the snake, it's more honed in on high frequencies, whereas, for example, the water or maybe the crowd are slightly more tailed off at the low frequency end overall. So that's a first order marginal statistics. We could also look at the modulation power. Um, and in this case, what we're doing is for each of the frequency channels, we're looking at the temporal signatures of these signals and looking at the power as a function of modulation frequency. Um, I think that the snake is very distinctive in the sense that it has a very strong set of oscillations right around 20 hertz. Um, that has to do with the fact that the snake, once you have, you have a rattle, that rattle is fluctuating with, roughly with a 50 millisecond period or 20 hertz. Um, some of the other sounds have more broad features overall. Um, and we could then go in and look at how these channels are correlated amongst each other. So here are the, the first order correlations. Again, the, the snake is very distinctive, largely because it has a huge amount of correlation. These channels are turning on and off coherently with each other. Um, sounds like water, on the other hand, the sounds are mostly independent across frequency channels, and therefore you get a matrix that's highly diagonalized and highly uncorrelated as a whole. 
All right, so um, what do these sounds um, sound like? Just to give you a sense, here's the fire. And what we could actually do when we generate our synthetic variants, we can manipulate them and generate synthetic variants that have different levels of structure, where we could successively add more levels of structure. Presumably, by doing so, we could get sounds at the highest level, which are going to be the most realistic. Presumably, they're going to sound much more like the original. And then, so I'll, I'll go ahead and start with the, spec with the spectrum condition for this. In this case, it sounds very much like a shaped white noise, a little bit higher frequency than your typical white noise, but there's really not any evidence structure that would be indicative of a, of a crackling fire sound. The marginals. You start to hear some fluctuation going on, maybe it sounds a little bit watery. The modulation power. Again, you can hear that sounds sort of watery, but then you go to the correlations. And I think you see that that indeed does sound to start more, much more like a realistic impression of fire. And just for reference, I'll play the, ori the original sound. And then again, because of that added correlation, you can very clearly hear that snap crackle pop. Um, that would be evident in a cracking fire. Right, so we could actually do this for all the five sounds. Um, I'll just play the snake real quick, just so you could actually hear how it built up. Sort of a very pitchy white noise for the spectrum condition. And marginals, then the modulation power. In that case, I think you can hear maybe sort of a little bit of a rattle, largely because there's a lot of 20 hertz component going on. But then you add the added correlations. And then I think in that instance, you could actually very clearly hear that rattling sound overall. All right, so we're going to be um, looking at activity in the auditory midbrain. Um, this is a, the stage of auditory processing right before you reach the thalamus and then subsequently go on to auditory cortex. Um, so we're going to be recording in a head fix, um, a wake rabbit. And essentially what we're going to do is we're going to insert a multi-channel probe, either a 64 or 16 channel probe directly into the inferior colliculus along a ton tonotopic gradient. Um, I think the first thing that comes to mind is why would we use the inferior colliculus? Why not, let's say, go to a higher level like auditory cortex um, to study this, this type of transformation um, or what may be going on with textures? And I, I think that the first um, important aspect of the IC is that it's highly tonotopically organized. And that organization is very easily accessible. If you were to go to cortex, tonotopy is arranged along the cortical surface. It would be very hard with a single electrode. You'd have to come tangential to the surface to actually get that tonotopic axis. Um, and here's a, a, a nice illustration from one of my students' work um, back in 2010. Um, Francisco Rodriguez um, went into the um, inferior colliculus of the cat, um, made multiple penetration sites, and this is actually an exposed inferior colliculus. You do have cortical matter on top, so that was after an exposure. And after you do that, you could actually reconstruct the tonotopic organization. Um, each dot is one recording channel, and the color tells us the frequency. Um, note that the higher frequencies are on the ventral aspect of the IC. Blue, free, blue represents low frequencies, which are much more on the dorsal aspect of the IC. This very nicely illustrates how easy it is to generate, generate or access this tonotopic organization within the central nucleus. Now, that's not the only reason why we care to use the IC. Um, it turns out that the IC is probably encoding, at least in a temporal code, a lot of the features that we're really interested in. Um, and one thing that we've done, and Francisco actually did, he looked at natural sounds and asked the question, what are the modulations that are available in natural sounds? This is actually a modulation power spectrum for vocalizations. We've done it for a variety of sounds, background sounds. We've done it for speech, so on and so on. Um, I, I think you could see that there's sort of a range of modulation frequencies extending out to several hundred hertz, in this case, about 300 hertz where you have a lot of energy or power um, in the modulation of natural sounds. 
And you can look at the sensitivity of neurons in the ICC, and you can see that they encompass a lot of that space. Now, just to give you a reference, if I were to go to cortex, cortex probably would be limited somewhere in the 25 hertz range in terms of temporal processing. So in essence, if we were looking at temporal, you know, cortical processing, we'd basically be looking at a small snippet of the modulation power um, that's available in natural sounds. So I think for a lot of these reasons, the ICC um, is sort of an ideal structure. And not only that, it sort of matches the level of structure, the second level of structure that McDermott and Simoncelli originally postulated in their model. All right, so um, let's see an example of what this looks like when we actually record. So in this case, we have a 16 channel probe. Here's a frequency tuning for a variety of neurons. So I'm showing um, different neurons where we compute the frequency response areas. And what you can see is that as you go in depth from dorsal to ventral in the penetration, you could see that the frequency is being shifted up from low to high um, following a tonotopic gradient. If we can look at neural activity in response to more complex sounds now, and then we could go in, for example, percent a crackling fire, and you can look at the neural activity that results from that. So in this case, you could see that different channels are being turned on and off. Some channels appear to be more active than others, um, which may represent the, the spectral power in the sound. But presumably, some of the temporal changes that occur in, in the ongoing response are probably reflecting the temporal modulation structure of that original sound. So what we can now do that we have this graph, we could actually go in and start to measure some statistics that are analogous to those that um, McDermott and Simoncelli originally measured in their auditory model. Now, granted, of course, this is not the, an auditory nerve. So we're, we're doing the same type of statistics, but there's some differences in that we're not looking at the same level of structure. This is really a more a higher level of processing compared to the first stage that they would measure. So uh, for starters, we could actually measure correlated activity across channels, very much like they looked at their frequency correlations. So the idea is that different frequency channels, we can compute a correlation coefficient. And I think what you could see here in these spatial correlations, I refer to them as spatial because we're talking about channels. Um, some channels seem to be highly correlated. Other channels are not highly correlated with each other in terms of their temporal patterning. Um, because these channels are indeed tonotopic, we're going to change notation a little bit. We're going to call these spectral correlations um, as a whole. Now, it turns out correlation doesn't just simply depend on space. So we could actually look at them as static. But the correlations are actually also going to depend on the type of fluctuations that you have ongoing in the neural activity. So we could imagine extracting these correlations over time. Um, if you actually do that, we get a matrix that has now three dimensions, a little bit complex to deal with. So we're going to simplify things a little bit. And we're going to look at these temporal dynamics by diagonalizing them. Just grab the diagonal and then compute the correlations only along those individual frequency channels. And again, in this case, you can see that there's temporal correlations that are evident. Um, this is going from negative 100 milliseconds to 100 milliseconds. So you can see that this activity here is relatively correlated on a short time scale overall, maybe in the order of 10 milliseconds or so is where you have correlations. Question. Question. Are, um, are both the spectral and temporal correlations robust to average sound level or well, one might suspect is more than average? We haven't played around with the average sound level um, overall. Um, we played around with the spectrum of the sounds, so we have manipulated that. And they are pretty robust to spectrum. So they do change a little bit, but um, they don't change very much. I think Shu Shuzai may have done a couple different levels, uh -huh. um, but it, it, that was only only a very small subset of recording sites. And from what I recall, you know, as long as you were moderate levels, they didn't change much. But I think if you get to really low levels, like let's say 20 dB SPL or so, then things start to start to change really dramatically at that point. So I think there's probably some level where once you go above it, it doesn't really change very much. But a lot of it's very anecdotal because we haven't looked at it in detail. All right, so we could obviously look at the spectral correlations, the temporal correlations. Those are actually related to the modulation power spectrum that Josh McDermott and Erosin and Shelley already described. And in addition to that, we could think about what we call the neural spectrum. And that all we're doing there is just taking each of the channels, computing the average power um, in the neural activity. Um, presumably, that's going to reflect something about the spectrum of the original sound. 
you can think of it like a rate place type representation of the sound. All right, so in essence, we're gonna we have these two sets of statistics, correlate correlation-based statistics or neural spectrum um, that we're ultimately gonna use as a measure of neural activity. So what do these look like? Um, so for this particular set of sounds, I'm gonna show you a couple of examples from individual sites from one recording site. And I'll start out by showing you the original sound correlations. And I think the first thing you note right away is that when you look across different sounds, these correlations, these sort of spectral correlations, they're quite distinct from each other. So I think you get the notion that if I were to actually put those patterns through a classifier, the classifier could probably very easily um, identify what each of these sounds is going to be. The, the, the real question at hand, however, is what's happening as you incorporate more structure into these sounds. So let's say we start out with very simple structure. Is this structure that we see here simply associated with, let's say, the spectrum of the sound? And what you see is that partly that might be the case, but not entirely. So you can see certain things. For example, when I look at only the spectrum, um, when I look at the fire, the original fire is vastly more correlated than the spectrum condition. Um, other sounds, which are somewhat simpler sounds, like, for example, the crowd of the water, the structure actually doesn't look all that much different. Um, the snake, you can see that the snake looks similar in shape, but maybe the power is a lot higher out here. And so as we successively add more structure, we add the marginals, and then we go to the modulation power, and then ultimately the correlation. I think you can see a couple of different effects. In some instances, the power and the correlation increases. But not only that, the pattern also changes as well. Sometimes the pattern looks more like the original. So in here, in this case, this pattern does not look very much like the original, but as it converges, it does appear to resemble the original pattern quite a bit. Um, on the other hand, the power in many of these channels is also increasing as well. Now, how about temporal? Well, I think more generally, the, the same type of story could be told in terms of the temporal correlations. So again, here's the original patterns. You can see quite diverse structure. Um, again, I'll point to the snake. The snake has a periodic pattern and note the periodicity, it's about 50 millisecond period. Again, reflecting that 20 Hertz fluctuation, indicating that these neurons are actually synchronizing at the, the rate of the rattling snake, um, the, the rattle and the snake. Um, the bird correlations by comparison, you can see that they're more broad. Um, and then other sounds like the water or the crowd, they're very impulsive, so the correlations are very fast. That means that the, these, these sounds are ongoing and changing in an uncorrelated manner over time. All right, so what does it look like for the spectrum condition? You can see that in that case, everything's highly uncorrelated and very fast as a whole. And then as you add more structure, these correlations successively become stronger, but then they also start to look a little bit more like the original sounds. So I think for the, for the correlations overall, at least from this example, you can see that both the strength of the correlations is being increased as you add more statistics, but not only that, the pattern of those correlations is also changing so that it more resembles the original sound. How about the neural spectrum? Well, it turns out for the neural spectrum here in this example, you can see that there is variation for sure across the different sounds. However, when you look at the spectrum condition, you already capture a lot of that variation. And adding more statistics doesn't necessarily change the structure that you see in the overall response power as a whole. And that may or may not be expected. I mean, on the one hand, we are incorporating a spectrum when we're measuring a measure that should be related to spectrum. So it might not be surprising that as long as you preserve the spectrum, that will be the case. But we do know that adding other statistics actually does affect firing rates in neurons. So the idea that this has to be this way doesn't necessarily have to hold true. All right, so just to summarize this overall, here's just statistics from a population. Um, here's the neural correlations. And what you can see is that in terms of similarity, how the any condition compares back to the original, you can see that that increases. Um, you may be wondering why we don't get a correlation coefficient or a similarity index of one in this case. And the reason is because we actually cross-validated. We took half the data for that response on the original compared it to the other half of the data. And so they weren't necessarily the same in, in that result. So it gives you sort of an upper limit what you get given neural variability in the data. Um, strength ratio, again, is comparing each condition against the original. And you can see that the power is sort of increasing um, overall for the neural correlation. 
Um, what you find for neural spectrum is that things are much more homogeneous. Basically, um, the similarity index is not changing very much, indicating that the pattern is not changing. On the other hand, the strength of the activity is not really changing as a whole. Is, is that what you expect to be different in like the other cortex? The neural spectrum wouldn't be so well predicted from, from the outset. Right? Yeah, I don't know. Um, it's, it's a tough one to say. It's a tough one. I'm not 100% sure. Okay. Um, it, you know, so on the one hand, neurons in cortex are without a doubt sensitive to the spectrum of the sound. Um, but yeah, their, their responses are modulated by other properties. But the same could be told true of the IC, right? Like, in, in fact, I expected that adding statistics might affect the firing rates. Um, maybe some statistics would just push the activity up and just drive out a lot more than others. Um, but as a whole, it doesn't appear to be that, that that's the case. And the same may be true of cortex, right? Um, we know that modulations and other components will drive it strongly or not. So it's not entirely clear to me whether it's going to push it up or down or what's it going to do, right? Just like, you know, I had an expectation for IC, but I didn't quite get that. Um, yes. Confused about spectrum. Is that just the... It's just really the... Activity it, ratio, sort of? It, neural spectrum, all we're doing, um, if you go back to the figure, we're just computing for each channel. We just compute the power. Yeah, okay. That, that's it. It's just the power in each channel. So you can't really get the, um, the spectrum anyway, because that's why it's so consistent. Yeah, it's yeah. But, but like I was saying, it doesn't necessarily have to be because we know that other features actually affect the responsiveness of neurons in the IC. Yeah. So that could at least theoretically have a bearing on it. But it wouldn't, it may not be captured by that analysis. They only may not. Measuring those differences out. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So Maybe the averaging over time, for instance, could take mm -hmm. care of it, right? All right. So, um, so I think th th this tells us that there's a lot of diversity in these patterns, and they obey certain rules that we may expect um, based on adding these statistics. Um, so I think the, the, the one question is whether these patterns could potentially be used to, um, to identify or categorize sounds. And so we, we tested this um, with the neural data um, using a classifier. Basically, we're going to use the, the five sounds um, and we're going to use single trial data to actually try to see if we could actually categorize these sounds. Um, so here's an example of how this is done. We can take the spectral correlations by themselves or we could combine them with temporal um, or one or the other. Um, we can put them to a classifier and we can look at the categorization performance. And in this case, you can see that for this recording site, you can actually perform quite well. I could tell you what the sound is. Um, the, it, there is a buildup with duration so that if the longer the sound duration that you use, the better that you could actually perform in terms of being able to identify the sound. Um, here's an example from all the different sites that we recorded, and you can see that you could actually do this quite well overall. Now, it turned out the performance also depends on the statistics. So as you add more statistics, um, you actually find that your identification performance also likewise improves. I think that may be expected from the patterns that we were observing. In those patterns, the similarity to the original sound um, was greater, and therefore you actually do better. I should say that the model was actually trained on the original sound. So the idea is that we trained it on the original sound. So the more that the response patterns look like that original sound, the better you should be able to do. What did you use for this plan? It's a Bayesian classifier, just an IE base. Yep. All right, so just to summarize, um, we could see these correlated, or at least statistics, we can measure certain types of statistics in the IC activity. Um, this correlated firing that we're observing, you could read it out, you could identify sounds. And not only that, um, you know, the spectral temporal cor correlations, uh, overall, they seem to be highly informative. So I think this brings up next to the question of whether these statistics could be useful um, and whether they could tell us anything about um, perception in general. Um, so we, we tackled this question um, using a texture recognition task. We could ask the sound, what, which sound is it? That's exactly the task that we just ran with the neural data. But we could also um, look at a discrimination task. And in this case, we carried out these experiments in human subjects. And we likewise carried out um, the same complementary experiments on the neural data. All right, so what does this actually look like? Well, here's a recognition for human observers. Um, you can see that as you add more statistics, just like the neural data, the performance actually improves. Um, so essentially, as you add these needed features or these very, what appears to be critical features, 
Um, your ability to recognize the sound improves. That's consistent entirely with Das McDermott and Errol Simicelli postulated and showed. On the other hand, for the purpose of discrimination, um, these statistics don't really appear to convey much information. It turned out, turns out just by looking at the spectrum of the sound, you could actually discriminate these sounds quite well. Now, this is all done with one second duration. I will say that we actually ran a whole analysis where we actually vary the duration of the sound. And these general ideas do hold up even across different sound durations. Um, however, the, 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 the discrimination on this end based on the spectrum is actually much faster um, overall. All right, how about the IC? How about neural data? Well, it turns out if we use a neural correlation classifier where we actually use the correlations to classify, note that it actually gives us performance that actually very much resembles what we see in the recognition task um, for the human observers. By the other hand, um, when we use neural spectrum, that's the, that's the scenario that really sort of matches what we observe for the human observers um, most prevalently. All right, so just to sort of summarize that, um, we have both the neural spectrum and the neural correlations. They appear to be predictive of certain aspects of perception. Um, in general, neural spectrum tends to be faster. It tends to be a very good signal for discrimination um, that actually replicates the data that we see in human observers. On the other hand, the neural correlations build up information a lot more slowly. They also build up information with statistics, which you don't see in the discrimination. And that pattern also um, send, tends to emulate what we see in the human data as well. Could you put a number on, on those good, the integration time to do? Scenario yeah, scenario? so we have estimates of the integration time. So um, just to give you an idea for the um, from the neural data, I think um, for the spectrum, it was in the order of like 50 milliseconds for discrimination. If you do it for recognition, it's actually a little bit longer. Um, it's probably like 200 milliseconds or so. Um, but then when you look at the, the same task with, with correlation, for example, you end up getting um, time scales that are much longer for discrimination and recognition, they're even longer. They're, for recognition, you're really talking in the order of you know, half a second or something like that, somewhere in that range. Yep. This is a question. Uh, uh, is it fair to say that the neural spectrum correlation you described is from the experimenters? Experimenters point of view. Um, are they also how we think of, about how these neurons process sound? I think so. So the question is whether um, whether the neural spectrum, the correlations, whether there there we should view those as the way that these neurons are processing the sound. And I, I think what I'll say to that is that we're we're extracting these statistics um, from the data. So the, the the IC in itself is not computing these statistics per se. Um, we're, what we're showing is that the population activity has these very regular patterns that you could extract this information from. Now, it's a secondary question of whether, let's say, somewhere in cortex, you're doing these computations that would measure correlations or measure the spectrum or something like that. Um, our data certainly doesn't show that, doesn't speak to that. And that's something that would, you know, would have to be done in future studies for sure, without a doubt. All right, so uh, uh, let me give you a, yet another example of whether, um, you know, how this could be informative to real world tasks, um, whether you could use this kind of information for categorizing sounds. Um, both Shuzai and Mina Sadegi, which is uh, one of my graduate students, sort of tackled these questions together in a paper. Um, she was working on the electrophysiology, whereas Mina was actually working on the computational modeling aspects of this. Um, what we actually did is we just, um, for starting out, we could, you know, take, um, a series of natural sound categories. And we develop a dynamical auditory model to see if we could actually use the model and some of these statistics from the model to categorize. Um, each category of sound had 13, uh, or 13 categories, but each had 15 exemplars of that category. And just to give you an example of how the, uh, the model works, it's just basically computing these correlations. We have spectral correlation or temporal correlation, but they're extracted about around time, right? So these are gonna be now dynamic, so here's a case for water. So you could see it dynamically changing. And here's a case for speech. King frog, Hylactrophryni augusti, also called. And so a couple of things sort of pop out when you look at these. Um, water and background sounds typically are fairly stationary as a whole. 
Um, very often, they, they, they seem to be uncorrelated, certainly for this water sound. Um, the channels are tightly correlated around, you know, zero frequency difference. Um, and likewise, in time, they're tightly correlated. Um, the speech by comparison is highly non-stationary. Um, and it's highly correlated both in space or channels a lot more, but also along much longer durations um, over time. All right, so here are some examples of correlations from these different categories when we look at the averages. What I want you to take away from this figure is the amount of diversity that you see. So the, if you look at the statistics from these different categories, they, they actually look quite different. And that sort of gives you the idea that maybe you might be able to use these statistics as a whole to be able to categorize different sounds. So we tested that with a model. We just basically took the same type of model where we have an auditory filter bank. We have the dynamic correlation network, which is giving you those outputs that I showed you. Those outputs are vectorized. They're fed to a Bayesian classifier. And then the question is, what do we get? Can we actually tell you what the categories are? Um, we did a, you know, all the, this is done cross-validated. So we train on a subset of the data categorize on the remaining data. And sure enough, you could do it. Um, it's not too hard to do. Um, note that this correlation structure actually is somewhat more informative than the spectrum. In this particular case, there's sort of a buildup time um, for being able to categorize. Um, in this case, note that the buildup time is in the order of a second or maybe two seconds. Um, so it's actually quite long, maybe possibly reflecting the difficulty in the task. You're training on one data set and then validating on a totally different data set with different sounds. All right, so um, I think, you know, this partly tells us that, yes, you might be able to do this, at least computationally, but, but what about neurons? Um, and so we tackled that to some extent um, with our neural data. Um, Shusai um, basically set up a paradigm where we actually have three sounds, and so it's definitely a more constrained scenario largely due to the limitations of recording in a live animal. Um, so we set up three different sounds, fire, water, and speech. Um, and we have multiple exemplars of each. So we have a total of six exemplars. What we're going to do is we're going to do sort of the same type of thing. We're going to cross validate it. We're going to train on a subset of data and validate on the remainder. Um, for starters, if you look at this data and look at it in principal component space, you can see how it breaks apart and you see that each of the three categories are actually highly distinguishable in the simple principal component space. So I think that gives you the idea that you should be able to categorize and why not? Well, this is one example, the same example that's shown here. You can see that you can reach almost 100% somewhere like 90% performance. Um, and again, it takes a certain amount of build up time to integrate that information. And here's what you get from a variety of different neurons um, or recording sites. Um, again, even across 11 recording sites, it's still the similar trend. So, um, you know, I think this basically says that, you know, essentially these, these statistics of the neural activity may serve a variety of roles, possibly things like discrimination, recognition, as well as higher level tasks like categorization. So this is all good. Um, however, the real world is a little bit more messy than that. And I think we come back to this original scene um, where we have all the background sound. And very often we have a task where we want to do like a speech recognition and noise. Um, and it turns out these texture sounds are really precisely sort of the type of sounds that we experience in these circumstances, right? Um, you're in a crowded room while you have all the you know, speech babble. Maybe you're in a busy restaurant, you hear the clattering of the dishes, you hear people talking, you have music in the background. It's these very crowded type of scenarios. Um, and so the, the, the next question is, how does this ultimately affect your ability to listen in the presence of noise? And I'll try to go through that quickly because I know we've got maybe 10 minutes at most. All right, so how do we, you know, how do we, how, how, do, how does the auditory system ultimately um, recognize sound? In the presence of background sounds, and ultimately, how do you know how do background sounds and possibly their statistics ultimately influence neural coding? And um, I have two students that have been um, tackling these issues. Alex Cohen has been doing a little bit of psychoacoustics, and Delena Pedrick um, has been doing some modeling and physiology. And I'm going to just go through quickly through some examples of how we do this. Um, so in this case right here, I'm going to show you just a basic digits noise recognition task that we've been using. So the idea is that you play three digits 
and the individual has to tell me what the actual digits are. They're from zero to nine. So um, I'm going to start out with this case right here, SNR of negative 90 dB. And I just want you to hear, I'm wondering if anybody could actually tell me what these digits are. I highly doubt that anybody could tell me what that is. Let's go to zero. I know what it is. I don't know, maybe any hands? 827, eight, eight, yep, that sounds about right. Here's the original. 827. 827, and actually if I play it back to you. So I think now that you've experienced it, you, you get the sense that you could actually sort of hone in on what that sound is. You have an expectation and you could actually perform that task. But in the naive case, it's extremely hard to actually do. So um, again, again, you know, we want to know how these statistics potentially contribute. Um, there's sort of the notion that the spectrum of the sound is really critical for this kind of task. So if you have overlap between the spectrum of the background and a target, um, that's going to interfere more than if you don't have overlap. Um, but uh, our notion is that really it's more than just the spectrum. These higher order statistics may actually be contributing. So one manipulation that we've been doing is what we call phase randomization. Um, effectively, all we do is we take an original sound, we randomize the phase spectrum, and effectively that kills all the temporal structure in the sound, all the fluctuations in time, all the modulations, and we preserve the power spectrum of the original sound. These two have matched power spectrum, but the temporal information is now gone. So I'll play them for you. That's the original. Phase randomized, just basically a spectrum matched white noise for all practical purposes. And so we could actually test subjects with this. So um, A27 in a variety of different backgrounds. And for starters, if you look at what your performance as a function of background, you, 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 you see right away that different backgrounds impair your ability to identify these sounds in different ways. Um, some sounds more than others. I think this is not really unexpected. Um, part of this may be due to the spectrum of the sound, um, basically energetic masking. But what we really care about is everything else. I really care much more about the modulation structure, the higher order statistics. And so given that the, the phase randomized in the original sound only differ in those high levels of structure, the spectrum is exactly the same, we could actually use those as a comparator to assess how much of the difference is due to the modulation content. And what you could actually see is that depending on the sound, some sounds you do see a, a pretty dramatic difference. The moment you phase randomize, for example, the, the eight speaker babble, you could see that your performance improves dramatically. That tells you that some of the modulation content is actually further impairing your ability to recognize these sounds. Um, you have a sound like the fire, which has a subtle effect, but it's actually in the reverse direction, indicating that that structure actually removing it actually helps you. Or, or actually impairs you um, in that case. So somehow fire, the structure of fire actually helps you um, in the recognition task. All right, so basically the differences between the red and the, the black are telling you something about the modulation content. Um, we can look at statistics of the sound. So here's a case where we actually use the texture synthesis. And we now take the, the spectrum only condition and we vary the SNR. And you get this level of performance. Obviously, it's going to vary with SNR. That's not too surprising. But the question is, what's going to happen as you add statistics? Well, if you add the marginal, or here is the original as a reference, the original sound has impaired performance. Again, that goes along with what we just showed. Um, but if I add the marginal statistics, know that the marginal statistics actually help you somehow um, in this particular example for the speech babble background. However, adding other statistics like the modulation power and the correlation actually impair your performance again, right? So I think this tells you that these statistics um, somehow are affecting your ability to recognize backgrounds. Um, a lot of this is very preliminary data. It's actually a new grant that we just started. Um, so I think hopefully in the coming years, I'll have more to say about all of this. All right, so I think the modulation statistics are critical. Um, this appears to suggest that. How about in the IC? Um, and in the midbrain. So let's see if I can hash this out in five minutes real quick. 
All right, so the, the paradigm that we're going to use is just going to be we're going to have sentences to so speech um, in some type of background. In this case right here, I'll just show you speech babble. And so note that the acoustic signal is just a mixture of the two. So we take those two signals and we'll combine them together. Um, and note that um, the neural activity, in a sense, is going to be a mixture of that foreground plus and background um, driven components. And what we would like to do is, in, in, in order to look at the neural activity, very often what we do in a lab is we actually measure the foreground. How is the foreground being affected by putting a presence of a background? Well, in our case, what we're going to do is we want to actually look at both. We believe that the IC is actually encoding information about both. So we want to be able to isolate the activity and look at the foreground related activity. Likewise, look at the background related activity and see how they're being affected. All right, so the, the paradigm that we're going to use is as follows. So we're going to generate multiple variants um, or multiple excerpts of each of the foreground and each of the background. So we have four background segments, and then we have four foreground segments. And what we're going to do is we're going to take all the possible combinations. So in other words, I could actually take the background and I can make copies of them across all the foregrounds, but then I could do the same thing for the foregrounds. And so basically you have a four by four where you have all possible combinations. And what I'm going to do here as a mathematical trick, I'm going to compute these correlations by shuffling the data first across background. So if I shuffle across this direction, in that case, the only common signal that will be preserved will be the foreground driven activity. So that will allow me to pull out the foreground driven activity for the speech signal, the foreground. But I could play the same mathematical trick in the opposite direction. And now I could compute the correlation shuffled across the foreground that pulls out the background activity. And so now we have these stimulus correlations um, where we could actually extract them out for the spectral correlations, foreground, background. I could do the same thing with temporal if I want. And the question is, how is neural activity being affected by these? Um, I wanted to ask if you were doing this at, I guess, relatively high SNRs, um, would you be concerned that like low SNRs that, you know, the foreground driven activity would be really, I guess, variable in the context of different backgrounds? It might be. Um, and I think, you know, the, the part of the question about this is like, it's not all linear. So yeah. the expectation is that things are not going to necessarily be additive. And so I think going with those high, low SNRs, right? Non-linearities will definitely kick in, and they will they will probably affect things. But but I think not even at low SNR, at so zero dB SNR, a lot of interesting things are happening. So here here's a couple examples, um, just to show you real quick. So here's a battle um, eight. Um, we have a zebra print song in the foreground, and what we're doing is we're putting eight speaker babble in the background. Here's a foreground driven correlations which are associated with the zebra finch, and then the background driven correlations which are associated with the babble. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to change now the background and only change the background. The foreground is not changed at all. And note that by changing the background to a bird babble, it completely changes the neural activity for the foreground. And likewise, if I put water, it completely changes everything. Um, so it's not only changing the background, which is the, the actual variable, dependent variable that you're changing, but you're only also changing the foreground related activity. All right, so um, here's another example just to look at this with textures. So we're going to take a background noise, in this case, speech babble, use texture synthesis, and um, look at the statistics, look at add different statistics to the background. Do the same thing. This is correlations for the foreground for speech only um, in the clean condition. When I add the spectrum condition, um, note that the correlations of foreground are changing. The marginals, again, things change in the foreground, modulation power spectrum, and then the correlation. And so I think that the takeaway story is that somehow the this background activity, changing the properties of the background, strongly influencing what's going on in the foreground overall. All right, so here's how we're going to sort of look at this. Um, here's, again, quiet. Um, here's the original case. Similar to the examples that we did here, this is speech in, in the presence of babel, speech in the presence of water. And then what I could do is I could actually phase randomize the sounds. In other words, I could kill the temporal structure in the background sound only, right? And so 
if I do that, things change. As I just showed you, changing the properties of the background changes everything in the foreground and the background. Um, the same is going to be true of the water. Things are going to change. And what I could do is come up with a distance measure between the original condition and the phase randomized. The idea being that that distance is going to be representative of how things are, how the, the neural activity is being changed and basically being changed by the modulation content of the sound, given that phase randomized and original, that was only the only physical acoustic difference between the two. And what do you have? You have that when you look at multiple backgrounds, you see very clearly that some backgrounds are really strongly affected. Um, and that indicates that presumably there's some modulation information in there that's somehow affecting the neural activity. Other backgrounds, it looks like the modulations really are not doing nearly as much as a whole. All right, so I'll end it with that. Um, and just to basically summarize, I, I think what I've tried to demonstrate is that we can actually go in and measure some of these statistics that were described in the original mathematical model that Mike German and Shelley came up with. That those statistics actually um, appear to be very informative. They could be used for a variety of different tasks. Um, and, you know, at, at the end of the day, not only are they informative in categorization, recognition, so there's that potential that they could be used, but they seem to be very important possibly for things like mastery listening to speech in a complex environment with noise. Um, so I, I think overall these statistics, you know, they may provide really important signature um, of how we listen to in the real world, right? Um, they're motivated, the statistics themselves are motivated by the auditory system. And it looks like when we actually look in the auditory system, we see trends that actually replicate some of the behavior that we experience in the real world. All right, so of course I can't go without thanking everybody who's contributed to this. Um, so of course my collaborators um, on this project are Heather Reed and Ian Stevenson, which are both at UConn. This is a project that's funded by um, NSF and NIH. It's a CRCNS project. Um, this would certainly not be possible without um, the contribution of the students, the postdocs. Um, Mina, um, she contributed largely to the computational monitoring with the categorization. Delena, Pedrick, and Alex are sort of new on this. They're actually the ones working on the signal and noise. Shusai has been um, working on the texture recognition, categorization, et cetera. She's actually trying to work on hearing related loss, hearing loss and how these statistics may actually um, impart benefits or disadvantages during hearing loss in that case. And of course, NIH, NSF, um, they've been very, you know, without them, I could not do this work. All right, thank you. In the in the neural data. Yeah. Um, so the question is whether we try to go even higher order statistics in the neural data. The answer is no, not right now. Um, we've thought about it. Um, you know, we could look at like kurtosis and a whole bunch of other stuff in the neural data, but um, at this point. Just doing this stuff has kept us really busy. Um, so it's not to say that some of the, some of those higher statistics may not be important, um, but we haven't looked at them. Um, I'll just give you one example. Um, um, let's see, McWalter and Thorsten Dow actually have extended Josh McDermott's model. And what they've done is they've added sort of the equivalent of a cortical stage, which is much more slower processing type stage. And in that case, the model actually has the ability of replicating certain things that the original model could not do, um, particularly rhythmic information, very slow rhythmic information. The original model could not replicate that, but now with the new variant of that, it could actually do that. So I think you're right that even if we were to go look at neural data, some of these additional statistics may be very important. And you can already get that sense that that might be the case from a simple model, even though we haven't been able to do it, but it, that, you know, in the future, maybe. <laughs> Hey Dan. How could, how could marginals improve performance? Um, so the question is, how could marginals improve performance? Marginals will sparsify a signal. They'll make it very peaky. So the, the envelopes all of a sudden become, you know, you have segments of quiet with a very sharp onset. Um, so they'll sparsify the input. And so now all of a sudden you have the opportunity where you have segments of quiet. Those, those segments are coming in at relatively fast rates. 
but because you do have quiet segments with a loud sound, quiet with loud, it's possible that you could be sort of reading between the, you know, between the, the noise, right? Um, and maybe that could help you with performance. But I, it's very clear when you, when I listen to it, um, yeah, like the moment you post those marginals, it's like, wow, all of a sudden I can hear these sounds again um, a little bit better. Yeah. So, yes. So looking at um, the interference in the program background, do you think it could basically come down to how similar is the spectral or modulation content of the background versus the foreground? Where if they're very similar, there's going to be a lot of sort of you know, interference competition for the same round. But if they're very different from each other, it seems that you know, for the environment where it's actually better than that. Yeah. Right. I think that's a traditional model. Um, that you know you will get interference. Let's say you're looking at modulations. So if the modulation power spectrum of the two sounds overlap, then you get more interference. And if the power modulation power spectrum doesn't overlap then you get less interference. So I think that's the traditional model that is upheld right now and that people are thinking about. And I think, yes, it'll hold, but I don't think entirely. And the reason for that is that the brain is extremely nonlinear. Um, and so, you know, what one of the things you're seeing here is that these statistics, so, so imposing the foreground, it's actually imparting an effect on, or, or the other way around, imposing a background with certain properties is imparting an effect on the foreground. If this was purely a linear system, that wouldn't be the case, right? If we had purely linear processing, you put the background in and then I go and measure these shuffled parallelograms, I would get exactly the same result as I got with the original case. So they wouldn't be affected in any way, shape or form. Um, so that, that may not be entirely true. These are normalized correlations. So you have that denominator, but we're actually looking at it without normalizing by the denominator. Where we're looking at power and the correlation and it still seems to be holding up so it's suggesting that you are getting nonlinear influences in there um, and i think that's going to be another important factor so yes overlap in the statistics is going to be important but nonlinear interactions that are ongoing in the neural processing are probably going to be important too there's a, there's a question um, yep you start from the uh, great talk. What is your view on the role of the auditory cortex? What can auditory cortex contribute to making sense of our auditory environment when I see already can do that? Well, I think um, uh, so. Auditory cortex, for one, um, I think just looking at the physiology, we know it's a lot slower, right? So I think uh, for starters, it's sort of extracting a fundamentally different type of feature. And I, I very instantly think about speech, right? Um, speech has multiple layered levels of structure from the very fine details that confer qualities like the pitch, the voice um, that allow you to identify an individual <clears throat> from those cues that are going to be more critical to, let's say, a recognition task. And we know, for example, from, um, from subjects who cope their implants, that those qualities are, they play fundamentally different roles. Um, so I think auditory cortex will probably help in extracting some of those um, higher level properties that may be important for recognition. Um, I know Josh McDermott has been looking at sort of these, um, you know, th these possibility that, you know, in auditory cortex, you may actually get a division for like, you know, parts of cortex that may be important for speech recognition. <clears throat> Other parts that may be more relevant towards looking at the textual qualities of sound, let's say music, et cetera. Um, so I think there's still a lot to be gained from looking at cortex. Um, it, you know, it's all about how the information is extracted, ultimately for that purpose of recognizing, perceiving, etc. Can you uh, a simple question? Can you verify how you compute the temporal organization? <clears throat> Can I verify or? Uh, no, no, I, I, I don't I don't understand how you. Oh, how we do it. Um, but essentially, what we do is, I mean, the, the correlations, um, are you talking about the correlation in the model or are you talking about in the neural data? In the neural data? In the neural data. So what we do is we take the, so you take the cochlear gram, right? Okay. You take each frequency channel. Yeah. And for each frequency channel, you do an autocorrelation. Uh -huh. so, um, it's actually a shuffled autocorrelation. And what I mean by shuffle, like we shuffle across trials. And <clears throat> the, the only reason we do that is because we are looking, we want to look at the stimulus of both um, correlation. And by doing that, if there's any neural variability, we can get rid of that component. Um, but we've looked at both. We've looked at the neural variability, we've looked at the stimulus-driven component, 
it's all done by using a correlation in the data. Yep. So as I recall, the uh, the tuning curve for the IC neurons are in V shape. Yeah. That and means uh, this, uh, <clears throat> depending on intensity, neurons will respond to a wider range of frequencies. So wouldn't this affect the neural spectrum and does your result generalize the different? Uh... Yeah, I've had uh, many thoughts about this in the past. Um, we have some unpublished data where we looked at um, frequency response areas. And obviously you've got a deep nice V shape. Which means that the bandwidth or the you know <clears throat> these the tuning of these neurons is actually frequency dependent, and for the same neurons we actually delivered more complex sounds, dynamic moving ripple sounds. We measured spectral temporal receptive fields, and what we saw in this data is that the tuning does not change when you use a complex sound. So this the, the, the tuning of the, the uh, extent of this, the power spectrum, for example, will, will widen. So um, and like smear it together. Then in the um, Thank you. 